in this lecture on geo visualization rasagya sharma is going to talk us through some of the key concepts in geographic visualizations uh, using his examples uh, from uh, both uh, digital mapping as well as data visualization companies he is going to illustrates these concepts with very interesting examples um cool with that let's get started so i'm going to do a very short sort of lecture on geo visualization my focus will be on talking through different types of geo visualization with the broad goal that i want everyone in this class to feel familiar with the different terms the different types even if we may not actually make all of these today right so uh, we may not actually do hands on geo vis work today but i want everyone to at least build a shared vocabulary and understand when to use which technique or learn to recognize these techniques right so usually when i talk about maps and geo vis i generally get asked two questions the first is i have this data set what can i do with it right so this is the first thing that we'll try to learn which is different types of geo vis geo vis techniques and the second that we'll try and do is how can i visualize it well so some tips on doing a particular technique and doing it well some tips on choosing which technique to use so those things will be again something that we'll try to focus on today um we'll run through 10 things um and an hour is usually like not enough so i will be skimming through some of the first few are i think the more interesting bits the ones later on become not as commonly used so um there'll be a sudden sort of influx of visual stimulus onto you bear yourself after lunch i hope you don't fall asleep um uh, but let's get started right the first thing geo vis geo vis really means geo which is maps and visualization so what we are really talking about is maps and visualization but to come to maps itself i think uh, i did not jump into the history of cartography and maps in general and even today we won't go too deep into it but i just wanted to pay at least a sort of nod to the rich history of map making right so ever since humans started to make sense of their world they've always wanted to articulate and share what they understood the world looked like and you could see that from like ancient folks trying to make really obscure maps of the fact that the world is flat and then there is water that falls and don't go too far away or you'll fall off into abyss or more mythological and religious connotation where people would talk about layers and you're in this one layer and there is hell below and heaven above or whichever different religion you are in right and so at all of those times people were communicating this in different forms what we can see here is on the left one of the earlier sort of maps that i think comes very close to the real map making right so in this case it's a it's a stone piece on which things have been carved and the one below is basically a same rendition of it on a sort of white um background right so you can see it has some sort of a t sort of a shape made um you can see like a, or an i like shape made it has a bunch of circles and shapes drawn and it was a mix of the real physical reality around them and then abstract religious mythological thing so this is like a babylonian map back in 600 bc and they came very close to depicting the real world around them and this is what, like 2600 years back so fairly like old uh, what you see after this which is also somewhere around that time was the anaximander's map right and this map is probably one of the first maps that was devoid of anything that did not realistically exist right so it's it shows uh, the earth to be like a disk and there is ocean all on the edge and then there is this is basically like greek and roman so uh, in the center of europe around italy so you can start to see uh, that being the center of the map and then they did know that there is this area which is somewhat whatever we would call today as europe some area below which is what we would call as you know libya egypt those areas and then an area around asia right so we can start to see some maps obviously it wasn't colored this is a digitized rendition uh, but you can see people getting fairly good at at least the the sea the mediterranean sea the black sea those boundaries the idea of making all of these spaces right um, however these are still fairly um, simplified they weren't very detailed and they definitely were not very accurate right and there wasn't very good way to know if this is very accurate or not uh, till you have people like leonardo da vinci who pretty much made the first real ish map that we can see which is top down so up till now like even before 1500 a lot of people were making detailed map of cities but their approach to make it was go find a cliff that is the nearest on top of the cliff stand 
and then you get this perspective view of the city, right? And they would make that as a map. So a lot of maps before 1500, and in fact, even around 1500, you'll find are always from a perspective. Leonardo da Vinci's map was probably the first map, which is a top-down view, as if it is being seen by a satellite. However, 500 years before a satellite was invented. And his approach to do this, so I think he was commissioned by this newly formed prince who became like a king in Imola. And uh, he wanted like a view of his sort of town uh, or new estate that he now has. And this basically has a bunch of roads that you can see and very heavily packed like residential and area. And uh, Leonardo da Vinci is said to have made like an interesting instrument to measure distances. And he made like this round sort of disc, which led to like, okay, one sort of um, revolve the disc one time all the way, and then that circumference becomes some X amount of distance, right? And he basically rolled that disc around the whole area to measure and actually get an accurate sort of measurement of this area. And then you can see some sort of context being built around the center. So this, I think, is one of the sort of birth of interesting, accurate uh, map making, because before this, there was always you know, dragons and mythical things on maps, and you'll see these nice, interesting religious elements, et cetera, mixed with the real world map making. Um, so this was maps, and I've obviously not done justice with the single slide, but I'm hoping you at least get some sort of uh, references on it. Uh, by 1800s, maps have become commonplace. Everybody has really accurate maps. People have found out ways to use maps for traveling, which basically led to the whole sort of golden age for at least Europeans, where they went and found a bunch of different countries, found out the world is not flat, and you know all the other interesting things. Uh, but you can still see some very interesting use of map now being used to convey other layers of information. So now maps are becoming and sort of background or context, and more data is being visualized on top of maps. So 1850s, this is the whale chart on your left. It's a very interesting piece because it's one of those crowd-sourced maps which people don't expect were happening in 1850s. So um, this one person, I think he was a sergeant, he basically would sign up um, fishermen who would go hunt for whales by telling them, uh, here is a diary. When you get to the place where you find a whale, make sure you record what type of whale it was and what location you were in. And then come back and give me that diary. And in return, I will give you a map that has every other sailor's recordings of whales as well. So this very interesting collaborative exchange, right? It's not like paying them to go find where whales are. They're anyway doing this, but they have a win-win because they get to know where every other uh, fisherman is also finding whales, right? So they build this map collaboratively and you can see he basically uh, divided that whole uh, Pacific Ocean side with um, a grid. And this is a particular projection that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and then within each grid, there is cells that are colored, either pink, blue, or green, depending on the kind of whale that was available there. So this was interesting because the map is no longer the important piece here. It's just a context to understand where to go. And you can see another one. This is a map of uh, India, Hindustan, uh, back in 1822, and all the sort of princely states and different sort of Raj uh, kingdoms that were there in 1822 back then. And this has obviously been done by a sort of British, I think, cartographer who was uh, asked to make like a map of how uh, India looked like back then. Right? So you can again see that the, the world or the map is a layer. And then on top of it, now there's a layer of like which estates or which sort of people live where. And it's interesting because the one on the left is about naturally existing things, right? So it's a very focused on nature and like things that are available in reality. The one on the right, in some way, is conceptual, imaginary. Like if you go from the sky, there is no boundary between these two princely states, but these are just humans who formed like perspective of okay, this is my kingdom, this is your kingdom, etc. Uh, but for us as uh, designers who are building maps, it's good to understand what maps represent, right? So maps by themselves would represent a bunch of things. They would have either things that are naturally available, area, um, that's water, land, terrain types, or things that humans have come to agreement that this is how it is, like country borders or things that humans have built, like land use, buildings, transport networks, points of interest, etc. right? Usually, uh, you would store this map data in two forms. So you would either have something that's called raster or something that is called vector. Uh, now, this is probably the only slide that gets fairly technical. So it's OK if you're not able to follow along too much. However, I'll give you some very quick tips to understand the two. Uh, 
A raster is like an image, like my photo that you would take from your phone. Every pixel holds some information. For a typical photograph, your raster image is holding RGB, red, green, blue, basically color of each pixel. And then it comes together to form like an image. Uh, similarly, for a particular kind of satellite imagery, you may swap the RGB value with some other value. That could be something like elevation. So every pixel is basically an elevation. And you can get like a map of just elevation as numbers and you could color it to then get like a feel of oh, this area has peaks, this does not. Or you could get temperature or any other aspect, right? So this is one approach which you generally use for things that are maybe recorded from satellite imagery. They are very imagery based. So they're using some device to look at the world and then give you back information. Whereas the other set is vector, which is usually made either by hand or by tracing or by using some mix of machine learning that we do today with some sort of human intervention. And in this case, you would either make a point, so a bunch of things, and you would put point, 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 these are these things, or you would make lines, like this road goes from here to here, or you would make polygons to say this is one building area, this is one park area, this is one national park, uh, this is one hospital, etc. The advantage of a vector is that just like an illustration or a drawing for you, a vector becomes something that can be zoomed in as much, right? So you have all the level of detail. It also gets saved in a very different way, unlike an image. So you can actually give a lot more properties. For example, a road can have a property of the name of the road. How many lanes does it have? Uh, what kind of road is it? Is it a big highway, small road? Um, does it have a one way or does it ha allow traffic both ways? All of those properties can come on a single line. Right? You couldn't do that with raster, which is just images. Right? Um, and so you'll find a lot of data today which you visualize often being in the vector form. However, some layers of maps may be available in a raster form. Um, generally for raster, you will find these formats, GeoTIFF, JPG 2000, these are like formats that you can in, um, import into your mapping platform. Whereas for vectors, you'll have uh, things like shapefile for uh, data sets that are slightly older or are used for government purposes or for journalism. These are common, slightly more, uh, I won't say archaic, but more traditional formats. Whereas newer formats, especially built for web, are JSON formats like GeoJSON, TopoJSON, or a CSV, which is comma separated values. And then there's also KML, which is something that Google prefers. All of these are just format names. You don't have to remember them. We won't need them anytime today. Uh, but if any of you try to visualize data, these might be things that you may come across, right? And just familiarizing yourself with this. So maybe a few weeks later, you're making a map with some data on it, and you're like, ah, Rasagya told me about KML. I don't have to get scared about it. Um, and this is like a typical vector data set, right? So you have a map. On the map, there is one dot uh, which you can see over here, right? So this one is India Gate. Uh, so I could represent that as a node or a dot. Uh, I could make a line, which is a way. So this is the road, like the Rajghat sort of a road. And then I could make a sort of relation or a polygon, which shows a building. Like this is this sort of uh, in front of the president's house, there are a bunch of these administrative buildings. And you can see those uh, marked out on a particular map. Right? So this data set would essentially have one point, one line, one polygon. And that becomes a data set that we can then import onto a map like this of Delhi. Now, we touched about this very briefly yesterday, but I also want to again sort of highlight some of this, which is that maps are turning something that is real, which is a globe, kind of like a sphere, but not really a sphere, um, into something that is 2D, right? And therefore, there is always distortion. You'll have to skew things around. Uh, and projections are basically equations that allow us to do this. So there are a bunch of different projections, bunch of different ways to take a globe and then turn them into a 2D surface. You can see some of these here. This is from uh, Bostock's uh, one demo of different projection, and he cycles through a bunch of variations. You obviously can see the most common projection, which is called Mercator. Uh, one of the advantages of Mercator is it makes uh, latitudes and longitudes perpendicular to each other. So they are very simple grids on a map. Uh, he also st like they also stretch very interestingly. So uh, anything on the top, like if you take make a straight line on a map and you sail in that direction, it would be a straight direction. Um, that isn't always the case if you look at some of the other bits. Uh, and um, 
some of the other projections get like more and more wild and interesting. And uh, like most things, there is an XKCD comic about it, which says what your favorite map projection says about you. And obviously, the first one is Mercator, and it says that you're not really into maps, right? So clearly, a judgment here of people who like Mercator. But then there are a bunch of other ones, right? Like this one, which is Van de Grit. I mean, he basically took something like Mercator, but made like a nice circle around it. So you know, it feels like it's, it's more uh, like a real world. But that's really not how Earth is. And this probably would be a better map if Earth was a disk flying in the air, right? Um, there are a bunch of other interesting XQCD, which uh, sort of comic talks about other map projections. So for anybody who wants to nerd out, go check XQCD about this. Um, but for us uh, as designers, it becomes interesting that map making is very similar to any other sort of design, visual communication artifact that you make. There is always figure, and then there is ground, right? There's always a subject, and then there is something in the background. So this is an example of a map that I had done, just a small experiment for Bombay. And in this case, the map visualizes all bus stops in Bombay that are on OpenStreetMap. And then we had some traffic data uh, aggregated over a month, and it visualizes the major roads where there is like a lot of traffic. Right? And you can basically see in this map the sort of artery, arteries like um, structure of all the roads in Bombay, a bunch of areas where there are a lot of bus stops. Uh, so the focus here was to highlight this, the bus stops and the traffic, right? And therefore, that is shown in this bright sort of neonish, uh, you know, lit up colors. While the map layer is really subtle, I'm not even sure if people in the back can see it, but it's this sort of grayish dark map, right? And water is shown in black, right? So in this case, we apply the same principles of figure and ground, where we say that something that needs to stand out um, on a dark surface needs to be lighter. If it was a light surface, it needs to be darker. And we would use the same principles if you're visualizing data, right? So instead of taking a map like this, which is like a typical Google map, fairly colorful, it has roads in different color, it has parks, it has lakes. Um, instead of that, I would recommend we start with something which is minimal, like a light map, right? And in this case, the colors are muted, and so they're all gray. You can't really see roads in this because Stevie, again, has some really nice projection 